Hello, I'm Patrick Scott, Editor of Studies in Scottish Literature and Advisor to the Sims Initiatives. The Initiatives is a digital humanities project of the University of South Carolina Libraries, funded in part with a generous grant from the Watson Brown Foundation. In celebration of Halloween, and to promote the site, we are reading one of Sims' ghost stories throughout the month of October. The story is called Grailing, or Murder Will Out, and it is part of Sims' short story collection, The Wigwam and the Cabin. When we last left off, the narrator's father was in the midst of offering his much more pragmatic version of the James Grayling story as a counterpoint to the ghostly tale told by the grandmother. The father continues his realistic retelling of the story now in part 21 of William Gilmore Sims' Grayling or Murder Will Out. Grayling remembered the conversation with the major at the campfire when they had fancied that the Scotchman was sleeping. How natural then to think that the Scotchman was all the while awake. And if awake, he must have heard him speak of the wealth of his companion. True, the major, with more prudence than himself, denied that he had any money about him, more than would bear his expenses to the city. But such an assurance was natural enough to the lips of a traveller who knew the dangers of the country. That the Scotchman, MacNab, was not a person to be trusted was the equal impression of Joel Sparkman and his nephew from the first. The probabilities were strong that he would rob and perhaps murder if he might hope to do so with impunity. And as the youth made the circuit of the bay in the darkness and stolen stillness of the night, its gloomy depths and mournful shadows naturally gave rise to such reflections as would e be equally active in the mind of a youth and of one somewhat familiar with the arts and usages of strife. He would see that the spot was just the one in which a practiced partisan would delight to set an ambush for an unwary foe. There ran the public road with a little sweep around two-thirds of the extent of its dense and impenetrable thickets. The ambush could lie concealed, and at ten steps command the bosom of its victim. Here then, you perceive that the mind of James Grayling, stimulated by an active and sagacious judgment, had by gradual and reasonable stages come to these conclusions, that the major was an object to tempt a robber, that the country was full of robbers, that MacNab, the Scotchman, was one of them, that this was the very spot in which a deed of blood could be most easily committed and most easily concealed, and one important fact that gave strength and coherence to the whole, that Major Spencer had not reached a well-known point of destination, while MacNab had. With these thoughts thus closely linked together, the youth forgets the limits of his watch and his circuit. This fact alone proves how active his imagination had become. It leads him forward, brooding more and more on the subject, until, in the very exhaustion of his body, he sinks down beneath a tree. He sinks down and falls asleep. And in his sleep, what before was plausible conjecture becomes fact. And the creative properties of his imagination give form and vitality to all his fancies. These forms are bold, broad, deeply colored, in due proportion with the degree of force which they receive from probability. Here he sees the image of his friend, but you will remark, and this should almost conclusively satisfy any mind that all he sees is the work of his imagination, that though Spencer tells him that he is murdered, and by MacNab, he does not tell him how, in what manner, or with what weapons. Though he sees him pale and ghost-like, he does not see, nor can he say, where his wounds are. He sees his pale features distinctly, and his garments are bloody. Now, had he seen the spectre in the true appearances of death, as he was subsequently found, he would not have been able to discern his features, which were battered, according to his own account, almost out of all shape of humanity and covered with mud, while his clothes would have streamed with mud and water rather than with blood. 
This has been part 21 of William Gilmore Sims' story, Grayling, or Murder Will Out. I hope you will tune in next time for another section of this twisted tale. If you would like to read the full text of this story, or any of the many other works we have available, simply visit the Sims Initiative website at sims.library.sc.edu. Until then, Happy Halloween!